Hi, welcome to this lecture in uh, our orthopedic uh, board review lectures. Uh, this is uh, one of the orthopedic trauma lecture. This is the first lecture in the upper extremity in adult. A good source that you can use is this uh, book written by myself. We'll start with the sternoclavicular joint. Uh, the sternoclavicular joint is the joint between the medial clavicle and the sternum. There is two types of dislocation that can affect the sternoclavicular joint, either the anterior sternoclavicular dislocation in which the, st the clavicle will go uh, anterior, and this is more benign condition. Usually the treatment is observation. Unless the patient is really bothered with it, you can do uh, reconstruction. Uh, what is uh, more serious is the posterior sternoclavicular dislocation. Why it's serious? Because we have important structures behind the sternoclavicular joint. We have the trachea, we have the esophagus, we have the carotid vessels. So you need to do close reduction uh, first uh, or attempt the close reduction. And if this fails, um, open reduction is indicated. Whether you do close or open reduction, um, you have to have a thoracic surgeon available. As we said, there is uh, the carotid vessels are behind the sternoclavicular uh, joint. Uh, so you need to uh, make sure you have a backup if something happened. Um, usually, uh, the, uh, the method that we do, as I said, is close reduction using uh, a towel clip. So you uh, hold the clavicle with the towel clip and you pull it out uh, and up. Uh, which means anterior, and this usually result in uh, stable reduction. Um, yeah, you can see here, this is a CT of one of my patients. Uh, uh, he was transferred to our uh, level one trauma center for um, left, uh, uh, sterno uh, left uh, uh, sternoclavicular dis posterior dislocation. You can see here, uh, here is the trachea, here is the esophagus, and here are the vessels, so there is compression here. Uh, and you can see here the uh, coronal uh, reformat so it's empty uh, because it's at the posterior level. Uh, so here is uh, the uh, clavicle uh, uh, posterior. So this is a posterior dislocation. And in the coronal, you can see it empty. Close reduction was done using, as I said, the towel clip. And we were able to obtain successful reduction. You can see here, this is the left side here. It's reduced. So this is the clavicle. As you can see, the clavicle is reduced to the sternum compared to this picture uh, to this picture here the clavicle is uh, at the same level right and left here it is much more posterior and of course you can see this cut here the cut before the reduction is empty because it's a posterior level here is uh, uh, reduced um, uh, this was very stable reduction and uh, nothing else was uh, needed for this patient if you cannot get um, a, a closed reduction or it uh, immediately comes back as soon as you leave the clavicle, uh, you need to do uh, open reduction. Uh, one important thing you, uh, I would like to remind you is the main stabilizer of the sternoclavicular joint is the posterior capsule. Okay, The posterior capsule is the main stabilizing uh, factor uh, for uh, the, stern, uh, the sternoclavicular joint. So uh, you may get this um, uh, picture and tell you what is the main stabilizer stabilizer of the joint. Uh, the main stabilizer is the posterior capsule. So now we're going to speak about posterior sternoclavicular dislocation in uh, children and young adults. So uh, we mentioned one anatomical fact in the previous slide that the most important um, stabilizer for the sternoclavicular joint is the posterior capsule. There is a very important, another very important anatomical fact for the sternoclavicular uh, uh, area in which that the medial uh, uh, part of the clavicle, the medial uh, physis, um, uh, uh, ossify and fuses the latest in the life. It's around the age of 20. Uh, so you can be 18 or 19 and you still have a cartilaginous part of the medial side. Um, uh, so the uh, last um, uh, physis, uh, the, the last um, uh, secondary or civic center to appear in the body is the medial clavicle. Uh, that's why uh, young adult at the age of 20 may have cartilaginous part of their medial clavicle. Uh, why is that important? Because you can get 17 or 18 patient, uh, uh, 18 year old patient, and um, when you get a CT and um, you you will think that they have a posterior dislocation. This is one of my patients. Uh, he was 17 year old, and uh, obviously this CT show posterior sternoclavicular dislocation. Uh, however, that's not correct. This is not a um, sternoclavicular dislocation. It's actually physial injury or Salter Harris type 1 injury uh, of the uh, medial uh, clavicle. And you can see here, so this is an MRI. Uh, 
uh, done for this patient and it shows that the, the clavicular the sternoclavicular joint is actually is not dislocated there is the joint what happens is posterior fracture of the um, uh, medial clavicle uh, why is that important fact to know? Because uh, these patients, uh, if they don't uh, show symptoms, if they don't have dysphagia or dyspnea, they don't need surgery uh, because there is expected um, uh, 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 remodeling that can happen in these patients. Uh, so uh, you may get a scenario, a 17-year-old patient, and they give you this CT, it will, they will tell you what's the next step. The next step is to obtain an MRI to differentiate between dislocation or um, uh, type 1 Sulter Harris injury. Um, if the, uh, they found that if, they sh if the uh, MRI show it's um, a Sulter Harris injury uh, and uh, there is no um, uh, compression symptoms, the treatment is not surgery, the treatment is observation. Now we're going to speak about a very important topic, the scapulothoracic dissociation. Uh, what is scapulothoracic dissociation? It's internal degloving injury of the upper extremity, meaning that you pull the arm uh, very hard away from the body. However, the skin is intact. So in order for you to have scapulothoracic dissociation, you have to have an intact skin. Um, uh, however, inside that intact skin, you pull the uh, arm uh, very uh, hard away from the uh, body, so that will result in, uh, in most of the cases, of course, there will be fracture, but also there will be injury to the nerve, artery, or both of them. Um, how do you diagnose scapulothoracic dissociation? And you have to have an increased distance between the, the spinous process, which represent the midline, and the shoulder on both sides. You can see here is this is one of my patients. He was transferred to our uh, center because of suspected uh, 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 scapulothoracic dissociation. The distance from the spinous process to the left side is 14 centimeter. However, the difference, the distance between the spinous process and the right shoulder is. Um, uh, 17.3 centimeter. Uh, so this market increase is an indicative, of course, of the scapulothoracic dissociation. Uh, also, you can see um, the uh, uh, um, uh, injury that happened here uh, to the soft tissue, comparing this, the size of the soft tissue here to the size of the soft tissue here. Uh, so uh, it's a serious injury, scapulothoracic dissociation. Um, it's internal degloving injury of the upper extremity. Um, uh, uh, most of the cases associated with uh, neurovascular injury and it's also associated with a fracture that uh, becomes uh, uh, distracted as we're going to see in the next slide um, uh, the most important uh, factor that will uh, determine the outcome is the neurological affection because um, as we said, uh, uh, there is significant uh, number of the scapulothoracic dissociation that will have nerve and vessel injury. Actually, 50% of the patient will have flail arm. That means that all the nerves are pulled um, uh, at the level of the brachial plexus, so they get flail arm, completely uh, paralyzed arm. Uh, so these patients will have, um, of course, a bad uh, result. Uh, the amputation is about 25% and even mortality is about 10%. Uh, it's a very serious condition. Scapulothoracic dissociation is a very serious condition. 50% will have flail arm, 25% uh, will a end in amputation and um, a 10% um, mortality rate. Um, management is you have to assess the pulse. You have to assess the pulse of the affected extremity uh, clinically and um, if needed with CT angio or um, uh, um, uh, angiogram. Uh, and of course, if the patient is not intubated, uh, neurological studies and um, neurological assessment is very important to see what is the, uh, the uh, nerve um, function of this patient. Uh, they may give you a scenario like this one, 45 year old, uh, fall from the tree and they have a clavicle fracture. They will show the clavicle fracture we all, as we're going to see in the next uh, slide, we all used for a clavicle fracture that is shortened. We discuss always that indication for clavicle fracture is like two centimeter shortening. So more, the, um, most of the fracture clavicle are shortened, but the fracture clavicle that they will show you is widely dis, uh, distracted. Uh, also, there may be a glenoid fracture that they will show you that's also distracted, and the patient will have hypotension and no pelvic injury. So pelvic injury is not there. So what is the cause of that hypotension? Uh, 
um, uh, most probably this is a case of a scapulothoracic dissociation. Uh, so what is the next step? Next step is, of course, assessment of the pulse because you want to see if the um, uh, um, uh, uh, subclavian artery is affected or not. Uh, uh, or the brachial artery is affected or not, and after that, if the patient is not intubated, neurological assessment. Uh, here is one of uh, my patients um, uh, that came, uh, this is the same patient that we saw in the CT before. You can see here, this is a clavicle fracture, so they can give you this x-ray in a scenario of a patient with hypotension. Uh, this is not the clavicle fracture that you're used to, that there is a shortening. This is a widely distracted, uh, displaced um, a clavicle fracture. Uh, also, the CT will show the glenoid fracture. Uh, and you can see here, this is the, the fracture here. You can see in the 3D CT. And if you look here closely, uh, so don't just only look to the, the bone, look to the, this is a CT angio. And this is the uh, 3D of the CT angio. You can see here uh, that there is, uh, um, an injury to the subclavian artery. Uh, so this patient has a scapulothoracic. Of course, the first thing you have to do is assessment of the pulse uh, with, uh, clinically, and then after that, you do CT angio or angiogram. And then uh, if this patient needs uh, a repair, he needs to have the repair, you always have to document uh, the neurological function of this patient if they're not intubated, because uh, neurological affection is the uh, cause uh, 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 the most important factor for the long-term function uh, for patients who do not end in amputation. Now, after we talked about the um, uh, sternoclavicular and uh, scapulothoracic dissociation, we're going to speak about the AC joint uh, or the acromioclavicular joint separation. It's a very important topic. Um, it's a very common injury. Um, uh, sometimes you would be asked about uh, the best view to visualize the AC joint. It's called Zanka view. The Zanka view is 50% of the uh, uh, shoulder uh, dose, uh, and the uh, X-ray is directed uh, 10 degrees cephalad. So this is called the Zanka view. It is directed 10 degrees cephalad with 50% uh, of the sh uh, uh, standard shoulder penetration. Um, uh, the classification, we all know the classification goes from one to six. One is just only mild sprain. Two, there is a subluxation. There will be disrupted AC joint, um, uh, but the CC ligament, the coracoclavicular ligament is intact. Uh, type three, there will be disruption of both the AC joint and the coracoclavicular ligament. There will be increase in the uh, uh, coracoclavicular uh, distance, um, but it will not be more than double. Uh, why? Because if it's more than double the distance of the intact size, so you get a shoulder um, uh, uh, x-ray, I'm, I'm sorry, you get a chest x-ray with the patient sitting, and um, you compare the CC ligament on both sides if it's uh, increased but not more than double. Uh, this is um, type 3. If it's more than double, this is type 5. Type 5, um, in addition to the AC uh, 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 ligament and the CC ligament, there is also detachment of the deltoid fascia. Uh, you, can, you can see here, this is one of my patients. You can see how um, uh, the um, uh, clavicle here and the medial, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the lateral part of the clavicle is um, uh, superiorly migrated. This distance here between the coracoid and, and the clavicle is more than double the other. Other side. Uh, so differentiation between type 5 and type 3 is by the CC ligament. Um, if it's increased but less than doubled, uh, this is the uh, type 3. If it's more than double, as you can see here in this um, picture for one of my patients, uh, this is type 5, which indicate that also detachment of the deltoid fascia. Type 4 is posterior displacement. It means that the clavicle will go posteriorly through the trapezius. Uh, type five, uh, type six. I mean, I'm sorry, is exceedingly rare. Uh, some also, some people say it's not existent. It's um, in which the clavicle will go inferior. Um, so it's, uh, the classification goes from one to six. One is just a sprain. Two is mild subluxation. Um, uh, only the AC joint is affected. CC is intact. Type three, uh, both the AC and the CC are um, disrupted. The CC distance increases, but not more than double. Type five. Uh, the distance will be more than double, and it indicates um, disruption of the deltoid fascia. Uh, type 4 is posterior displacement, type 6 is inferior. The treatment of the acromioclavicular joint uh, separation depends on the type. Type 1 and 2 is non-operative, type 4 and 5 are surgical treatment. Type 3 is controversial, however, most um, surgeons now will prefer to treat type 3 non-operative uh, because the result... Um,
uh, of uh, operative and non-operative treatment is very similar. Uh, however, complications are, of course, more with the operative treatment. Uh, in general, uh, uh, the old treatment of the um, AC joint separation used to be pinning across the AC joint. However, uh, this had um, uh, lots of complications related to migration of the hardware. So most people now will work on the coracoclavicular um, re restoration, either by screws or uh, by uh, anchors. Um, uh, if you are planning to put a coracoclavicular screws, these screws better to be removed uh, because if you leave them, uh, they uh, will break uh, because there is always some motion between the um, clavicle and the um, uh, uh, scapula and the coracoid. So if you leave this, uh, screw for um, longer than uh, six to eight weeks, it will break. Uh, so if you decided to put a screw, um, it's better to remove it. Um, uh, other methods of failure of the screw, sometimes it just pull out of the coracoid or uh, result uh, in a coracoid fracture. Uh, um, the, and remember, uh, you may be asked what is the nearest nerve to the uh, crococlavicular screws or the anchor, um, it is the musculocutaneous nerve, the nerve that supply the biceps muscle. This is here one of my patients, type 3. Uh, this is the uh, CC ligament. It is increased, but not if you compare it with the normal side, it will be uh, less than double from 25 to 100% uh, increase. And you can see here clinically the difference between this side and this side. Uh, he was treated with restoration of this uh, CC ligament uh, by uh, anchor, as you can see it here, um, here the immediate post-op. Um, this is uh, about like three or four month follow-up. Uh, you always lose some of the correction that you get. Uh, so there is difference here between this side and this side, but obviously uh, this is much improvement than uh, the pre-injury film. The next topic that we're going to speak about is the scapular and glenoid fracture. Uh, the first thing of the scapular fracture that I'd like you to know is the glenoid fracture. The glenoid, as we know, is the uh, articular part of the scapula that articulates with the humeral head in the glenohumeral or the shoulder joint. Uh, the indication to fix a glenoid fracture, if it's an intraarticular fracture glenoid with four or more millimeter displacement, this is an indication for internal fixation, either open reduction internal fixation or arthroscopically assisted. Uh, also, if you have a glenoid rim uh, that is more than 25% because it may lead to uh, subluxation or dislocation, or if you have already like a dislocated uh, a shoulder with a, a bony uh, bunker, that means bony, uh, bony rim of the glenoid, uh, this is an indication for eternal fixation. If the piece is big enough, it should be fixed with a screw. If not, it should be captured with its capsular attachment. So glenoid fracture, this is um, uh, one of the most important indications for scapular fracture fixation. The glenoid is the um, uh, articular part of the scapula. Uh, if there is interarticular fracture with uh, four or more millimeter displacement, that's an indication. Uh, if there is a, a fracture a rim that involves more than 25% or if it's associated with subluxation or dislocation. And as, as I said, if the piece is big enough in case of dislocation, it should be fixed it directly. If not, um, it should be captured with its capsular attachment. Uh, so you see here, this is one of my patients. He has an intraarticular fracture of the glenoid. You can see it much clearer in the uh, 3D format of the CT. Uh, this is the picture here of the uh, um, arthroscope. Uh, you can see the displacement, which is more than four millimeter. Um, uh, in this patient, we did a percutaneous reduction. We applied two screws. Uh, can you relate to the screws here um, from proximally uh, to obtain reduction, uh, compression, and fixation? And you can see here the picture post uh, fixation. Uh, there is no displacement and there is uh, good compression in between the two uh, sides of the fracture. Um, so, this is, as we said, this is a displaced interarticular fracture that was fixed with arthroscopically assisted fixation. And this is the patient here, a few months follow up. You can't see the fracture anymore. It's completely healed. Um, other indications for fixation of a scapular fracture, scapular neck. Uh, scapular neck fracture is an indication for fixation if there is more than two centimeter um, uh, medial translation or two centimeter shortening. If there is more than 45 degree angulation or if there is um, uh, uh, more than 15.
diameter uh, translation with associated with more than 30 degree or if the glenopolar angle is less than 20 the glenopolar angle is this angle between the glenoid and the lateral border of the scapula uh, this angle is usually uh, around 35 it's more than 30 so it becomes less than 20 this is an indication for fixation um, scapular body most of the scapular body does do not need uh, fixation just be aware that it associated with um, uh, a thoracic injury so if you get a scenario a ct for a patient with scapular body and they tell you what um, you have to be worried about the answer is just uh, injury uh, the last part is the acromion and scapular spine and these if they are displaced they need to be fixed uh, to restore the deltoid function and avoid impingement uh, by uh, tilting of the uh, distal piece uh, downward uh, which may cause uh, impingement uh, so this is one of my patients 13 year old girl uh, transfer for multiple fractures of the shoulder uh, she had a clavicle that was fixed interarticular fracture of the glenoid that was fixed by anterior approach and then uh, posteriorly she had the scapular spine and this was fixed with plate and screw so acromion and scapular spine if they are displaced they need fixation to restore the toilet function and avoid impingement this is here one of my patient um, you can see the amount of displacement here more than two centimeter uh, the scapular neck um, is displaced medial translation more than uh, two centimeter and in the same time here you can see uh, the um, the uh, glenopolar angle this is the glenoid here this is the lateral border of the uh, scapula so the angle between them you can see it became uh, less than 20 so this is also another indication here for fixation uh, so what we did is um, we um, did the uh, fixation here the, um, uh, uh, this is a one third tubular this is a recomplete we restored the, um, uh, the shortening and we restored the, gleno, the glenopolar angle you can see here uh, the angle is uh, restored to the normal which is more than 30 degree and there is no more uh, medial translation or shortening of the uh, uh, lateral border uh, so this is um, one of my patients, uh, shortening glenopolar angle less than 20, fixed um, open reduction eternal fixation, restored the glenopolar angle and restored uh, the shortening that was uh, present. Now we'll shift to the topic of fracture clavicle. Uh, so the pathology in fracture clavicle that the lateral part uh, of the clavicle will fall down by the, uh, uh, the arm, the weight of the arm. So the weight of the arm um, uh, through the um, uh, shoulder articulations through the coracoclavicular ligament will pull the lateral segment down uh, and that's the reason for the displacement um, remember if you have an open clavicle fracture it is associated with high incidence of pulmonary and closed head injury that sometimes comes in question so um, the clavicle uh, lies close to the chest and the head so if you have an open injury meaning if this is definitely a high uh, energy it may be associated with a uh, closed head injury or pulmonary um, injuries uh, what are indications of cla uh, clavicle fixation we all know that clavicle fracture is extremely common uh, is the most common uh, bone to be fractured uh, the vast majority of these cases don't need surgery so what are the indications z fracture pattern um, z fracture as you can see here you have one part here one part here one part here so it becomes like a z uh, so the z fracture pattern that's an indication um, if there is more than two centimeters shortening so if the two pieces here are overlapping with more than two centimeter uh, polytrauma so if you have a patient with clavicle fracture and um, uh, other injuries you may think about fixing the clavicle uh, open fracture this is definitely an indication or fractures tinting the skin when we call it pending open fracture this is uh, one of my patient here she was 16 year old girl and you can obviously see here that mm, fracture is tinting the skin so if you leave that for um, a few days it will become uh, an open fracture so all these are indications for fixation in cases of clavicle fracture for fractured clavicle that are treated basically non-operative you have two main things malunion and non-union uh, basically every case that uh, is treated uh, non-operative will have some element of malunion however symptomatic malunion is not that common it's only about nine percent of the patients treated non-operatively uh, the non-union uh, is about 15% of the patients. What are the risk factors for developing non-union with non-operative treatment? 
uh, female gender is one of the uh, important uh, things. Significant displacement, that's why in, uh, if there's significant displacement, we treat them operatively. Uh, of course, advancing age, uh, significant comminution and the trauma. Uh, remember, uh, the more comminution and uh, the more severe trauma, you will have more displacement. So the displacement, the comminution, and the severity are basically uh, goes hand in hand. Remember, female gender is associated with non-union. This commonly comes in the exam. Um, and uh, if you have a symptomatic non-union, so if you have a patient that has non-union and that's symptomatic, because sometimes it's not symptomatic, uh, the treatment is open reduction, internal fixation, uh, and bone grafting. Let's continue talking about non-operative treatment of mid-shaft um, clavicle fractures. So if you have, a, as we said, most of the mid-shaft clavicle fracture are actually treated um, non-operative. Um, and uh, these uh, fractures, um, in the vast majority of cases, yields with excellent result. Um, as, uh, if the shortening is more than 2 cm, we said in the previous slide that more than 2 cm shortening is an indication for surgery. Why? Uh, because if you leave the patient more than 2 cm, the resulting malunion will um, lead to weakness of the shoulder muscle, decrease in the endurance and strength. So the effect will be on the muscle power, not on the range of motion. Range of motion should be uh, the same. A uh, comminuted uh, shaft fracture uh, like Z deformity, we said that that's an indication for surgery. Why? Because uh, if you try to treat this non-operatively, uh, it has a higher rate of non-union and lower patient satisfaction. Uh, patient also mentioned significant displacement. So if you have more than 100% significant displacement, uh, the non-operative treatment will also lead to higher instance of non-union. Uh, so these cases um, are better treated operatively. Uh, regarding the non-operative treatment, the classic uh, teaching, uh, we used to say figure of eight. Uh, however, um, we know now that figure of eight and simple arm sling uh, basically give the same exact result resulting, uh, um, regarding the alignment. So there is no need for figure of eight because th this, of course, causes more discomfort for the patient. Now, after we talk about the shaft fracture, let's speak about lateral clavicle fracture. Uh, so remember, in lateral clavicle fracture, uh, the classification depends on the relation to the CC ligament, the uh, coracoclavicular ligament. The coracoclavicular ligament, as we all know, has two parts, conoid part and the tra trapezoidal part. The conoid part uh, is the posterior, more medial part. The trapezoid part is the anterior, uh, uh, more lateral part. Uh, so if the fracture is lateral to the CC ligament, two parts of it, the fracture will have minimal displacement. If you remember when we talked about the pathology of the fracture, we said that the fracture gets displaced because the weight of the arm through the CC ligament will pull this part down. So if you have now a lateral fracture that is distal to this area, the fracture will, in most cases, will not be that displaced. Now type 2 is the fracture which is uh, now medial to the CC ligament. So type uh, 2 is medial to the CC ligament and there is two subtypes, 2A, the fracture is medial to both areas of the um, CC ligament or type 2B in which the fracture is in between the conoid and the trapezoid. However, the conoid ligament has been ruptured. Both of them will be displaced and both of them needs fracture if, if it needs open reduction tendon fixation. And in general, uh, most distal uh, uh, clavicle fracture in professional athletes is better to be treated with open reduction tendon fixation um, to um, retain uh, full shoulder function. So lateral clavicle fracture, the fracture classification depends on the relation to the CC ligament. Uh, you can see here it is um, uh, lateral to the CC ligament. This is type 1. This is uh, minimal, usually is minimally displaced. Type 2 will be medial to the CC ligament, either medial to the two parts like 2A or in between of um, the, the conoid and the trapezoid with a rupture conoid, and that's called 2B. Um, a distal clavicle fracture in professional athletes or collegiate athletes, um, better to be treated with open reduction internal fixation uh, because it gives uh, a chance for better healing and retained shoulder function.
this is uh, one of my patient you can see here this is the uh, clavicle this is the cc ligament here cc uh, space and you can see here it's too much uh, displacement with the uh, fracture here uh, if you can see this part here this is the attachment of the cc ligament so actually uh, this type here has the CC ligament attached to this part and this part the displacement happened because the fracture happened through this part so if you this part here is coming now more medial to the uh, CC ligament because the CC ligament is basically attached to this piece here that has been avulsive uh, so this patient was managed with open reduction internal fixation as you can see here uh, because this piece here is so small and um, fixation um, uh, adequate fixation may not be able to obtain with the open with with plates and screws in this part um, we applied this called hook plate uh, and it uh, it gets its distal purchase from being underneath the acromion here of course this place has to be healed as uh, be removed as soon as the patient uh, heals because it may uh, restrict the range of motion so uh, again you can see this piece here this is the cc ligament the fracture coming here medial to the cc ligament that's why you can see the displacement uh, and because the piece here is the, a very small uh, i didn't think that i can get adequate fixation um, using uh, regular plates and screws so we use that hook plate to go underneath the acromion let's discuss proximal humerus fracture um, this is a very important topic that frequently come in the exam the first thing uh, that frequently come is the assessment um, you need to get a full uh, trauma series which includes ap scapular y and axillary view if the patient is having too much pain for axillary view you can get what's called velpo axillary view the patient lean backward and the beam comes from up um, this should be obtained in every patient uh, with uh, proximal humerus uh, uh, pathology or shoulder pathology this is very important uh, frequently ask it you will get a scenario for elderly male or a female um, uh, uh, minor trauma and um, having shoulder pain and then uh, you present it with AP which is either normal or have a minor fracture what is the next step the next step is not the treatment the next step is actually to complete the trauma series uh, then let's talk about uh, osteonecrosis osteonecrosis is a major complication that can happen after proximal humerus the risk factor if you have a four-part fracture means that you have uh, uh, the uh, shaft uh, you have the greater troch, lesser troch, and the anatomical or surgical neck. Uh, these are four parts, so the four parts have a higher instance of avascular necrosis. Uh, if you have more than 45 degree angulation, so if if, um, if it becomes in uh, vulgus or varus for more than 45 degree, if it's associated with shoulder dislocation, of course, if it had a spl head split, so the head become uh, broken into two pieces. And then the length of the metaphyseal extension, as uh, you can see here, so here is the anatomical neck it ends here so you have here a metaphyseal extension so if that metaphyseal extension uh, is more than nine millimeter you have lesser chance of avascular necrosis and you can see here the meta the the the, uh, the break is is just uh, distal to the anatomic neck so there is no metaphyseal extension so this has a higher chance of um, uh, uh, getting a vascular necrosis so if you have uh, extension uh, of the head into the metaphysis for more than eight millimeter this is um, uh, a lesser chance of getting a vascular necrosis and then also there is the medial hinge uh, uh, the medial hinge um, is um, uh, also a risk factor so uh, you can see here this this is the medial hinge, uh, hinge is maintained so this is lesser chance of uh, vascular necrosis this is the uh, the the medial hinge here is dis uh, is disrupted uh, so there is displacement here it's, it's, so if you can see here the uh, medial hinge uh, is undisplaced it's intact so this is lesser chance of lesser chance of vascular necrosis here this is a high chance of avascular necrosis uh, and what is the highest risk the highest risk of vascular, uh, uh, osteonecrosis is if you have four parts associated with dislocation so again the risk factors are four part fractures uh, shoulder dislocation angular displacement more than 45 degree head split the metaphyseal extension if it's less than eight millimeter and the medial hinge if it's dis uh, disrupted all this is risk factor for avascular necrosis uh, the highest risk is if you have four parts associated with dislocation 
So we have here an example of avascular necrosis. This is a patient, an elderly patient that had um, a fracture proximal humerus. You can see uh, the fracture is very close to the um, articular surface. There is minimal metaphyseal extension. Um, the patient was treated with open reduction internal fixation, good fixation. However, with time, collapse started uh, to happen, and um, it's obvious that this patient started to develop AVN. Uh, so at the end, um, the plate was removed, and in another stage, a uh, patient has a total uh, shoulder replacement anatomic. Now we're going to talk about the treatment of proximal humerus fracture. Uh, the first category of the um, proximal humerus fracture is the minimally displaced proximal humerus fracture. Uh, this is treated non-surgically uh, with a sling for comfort and early range of motion. Um, you don't need further studies. You don't need CT or MRI. Uh, all what you need is the complete trauma series, as we discussed before. Um, then the early range of motion is achieved by pendulum exercises within the first two weeks after injury. Um, you use, you're going to use the weight of the arm and um, do pendulum movement um, back and forth and also in circles. Um, we don't go for acute physical therapy immediately after the fracture uh, uh, or activity as tolerated because this is going to be hard to achieve because of the pain uh, and also it may result in um, non-union. So uh, we start with um, uh, pendulum exercises, but we don't do acute physical therapy in the first two weeks uh, um, for a range of motion because that may result um, into uh, non-union and also uh, the pain will be um, uh, the pain from the acute physical therapy will may, may not be tolerated by the patient. So we start with early range of motion. The early range of motion will be by pendulum exercises. Um, uh, this can be initiated as soon as the pain is under control, usually within the first two weeks. Um, and the physical therapy is usually delayed uh, for a few weeks till the pain is controlled. So avoid acute physical therapy immediately after the fracture uh, because of the pain. Um, the most important factor for the outcome is the early range of motion and the patient age. Uh, so you may get a question, what is the most important factor determining the outcome after minimally displaced humeral fracture? It's early initiation of early range of motion and patient age. These are the two most important. And how do we start early range of motion? By pendulum exercises. Now let's talk about operative treatment. We In the previous slide, we spoke about non-operative treatment. Uh, for the operative treatment, uh, if you have a displaced fracture in young uh, patient, that's an indication for open reduction internal fixation. Some of the technical point um, is you need to restore the medial support, as we show in the um, uh, previous slide about the medial culcar and its relation to the AVN. Um, support of that medial culcar is important to uh, prevent fixation failure. Other technique to prevent a failure is uh, incorporation of the rotator cuff in the construct uh, using a fibular allograft and um, using adequate length screws so that you can reach the subchondral bone. Um, if you are planning to, to do percutaneous fixation, uh, avoid having an anterior pin because this can cause biceps injury. Uh, most common complication of open reduction fixation, especially in elderly patients, is the screw cut out and penetration of the joint. That means that the screw will come uh, out of the bone and they can penetrate the shoulder joint. Uh, if you put external rotation uh, that, uh, after surgery, that will um, uh, put a uh, um, uh, stress uh, on the lesser tuberosity fixation. So if you uh, had fixation of the lesser tuberosity, try to avoid that position of external rotation. Uh, and um, uh, uh, after open reduction tendon fixation of the proximal humerus, um, uh, the uh, decrease in the range of motion uh, is commonly due to uh, scarring tissue, post-operative scarring tissue. So uh, for the operative treatment, as we said, displaced fracture in young patient, indication for open reduction tendon fixation. Techniques to prevent failure is restoration of the medial calcar, incorporation of the rotator cuff in the uh, construct, um, fibular allograft, and adequate size screws uh, to be subchondral. Uh, if you decided to do CRPP, avoid the anterior um, um, uh, uh, wire because it may injure the biceps tendon. The most common complication of open duct fixation, especially in young, in elderly patient, is screw cut out is going to come uh, out uh, from the superior um, uh, part of the um, uh, proximal humerus and, of course, joint, joint penetration. Uh, 
um, if you uh, did uh, fixation of the lesser uh, tuberosity, any external rotation will put lots of stresses on that repair. And um, uh, after open induction internal fixation of the proximal humerus, um, a very common you get a decreased region, range of motion because of scarring. Uh, this is an X-ray and a CT of one of my patients, young patient in the 40s, has um, a fracture humerus, a surgical neck, and trochanter. So this is a three-piece fracture. Um, uh, it was treated with open reduction internal fixation. Um, uh, this is uh, the follow-up X-ray, and this is the follow-up clinical pictures after a few months, uh, full range of motion. Um, uh, uh, in your um, um, uh, construct, um, as we said, um, uh, try to uh, maintain the medial uh, culcar. Um, you can use fibular allograft and always try to use adequate screws uh, length to be in the subcontral bone. However, uh, it's very important uh, to make sure that you're not doing joint penetration by getting uh, multiple fluoroscopy or getting live fluoro and move the shoulder in all degrees of rotation and making sure that the screws are not penetrating uh, the joint at any view. Another method of operative treatment is arthroplasty. Arthroplasty is the treatment of choice in elderly patient, active elderly patient, uh, with injuries like head split or if it's displaced four part fracture or um, a, a four part fracture, a fracture with dislocation. Uh, these cases are best treated with arthroplasty. There are two types of arthroplasty that can be used hemi arthroplasty or reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Um, hemiarthroplasty was uh, the classic method of treatment of these cases uh, about 20 years ago before reverse shoulder arthroplasty uh, is becoming now more popular. Uh, but uh, it's used as being going uh, less and less. Why? Because hemiarthroplasty basically depend on healing of the tuberosity fragments to the main shaft. And if this, if this does not happen, it will result in poor outcome. So if you are going to do um, uh, uh, hemiarthroplasty, uh, uh, we take sutures into the rotator cuff junction of the rotator cuff with the tuberosity fragment whether the greater tuberosity or the lesser tuberosity and then we put them back into the um, uh, shaft so we pass the suture uh, into the shaft and uh, and also into the stem uh, to try to get uh, some healing between the tuberosity fragments and the shaft uh, fragment uh, if this does not happen again it, it will result in poor outcome um, more and more people now is using reverse shoulder arthroplasty because as we no reverse shoulder arthroplasty is not dependent on uh, the rotator cuff integrity. So these are uh, examples of reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Um, um, if you see, uh, this is a four-part displaced fracture treated with um, reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Uh, and as we said, um, uh, this is not dependent on the healing of the uh, uh, tuberosity fragment and the rotator cuff, as we're going to talk later on in our shoulder um, uh, uh, lectures. Uh, another example of a dislocated um, head uh, with uh, four pieces fracture with dislocation, also treatment with reverse shoulder arthroplasty, uh, which, as we said, does not depend on the tuberosity fragment healing. Another specific type of proximal uh, humerus fracture is the greater tuberosity fracture. Um, the greater tuberosity fracture, uh, isolated greater tuberosity needs internal fixation if the displacement is more than five millimeter uh, or even three millimeter in athletes, because if you leave the uh, tuberosity in its um, uh, position, the, um, uh, the fracture position will result in impingement and will also result in altered myomechanics. There will be weakness of the muscle. So if you see here the greater tuberosity, um, uh, uh, the displacement, you can see it in the CT. Even you can see it better in the axial uh, pictures here. Uh, we know that the greater tuberosity um, has the attachment of posterior muscle, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. Um, all these three are posterior muscles, so they will put the greater tuberosity uh, backwards, as you can see here. Uh, so um, the, you can see how much is the displacement. This is much more than five millimeters. So this needs internal fixation. Otherwise, you will have impingement here if you abduct. Um, or um, here, of course, you have weak muscles because of the shortened position. So this needs internal fixation. Um, usually, the internal fixation is either by screws, as you can see here, or uh, you can see um, you can use um, heavy sutures. Um, uh, like uh, ethy bond or uh, fiber wire, um, and this usually um, uh, through uh, the um, rotator cuff, uh, and uh, it can uh, be, you can uh, drill uh, into the shaft and uh, suture them to the shaft. Uh, 
um, uh, uh, again, the, the treatment for tuberosity fracture, if more than 5 millimeter, is internal fixation, whether by screws or suture. Cases, there are uh, cases of fracture dislocation, which means um, the dislocation of the shoulder with fracture of the greater tuberosity. The treatment of these cases is closed reduction and then reassessment. Um, if after uh, reduction of the shoulder, the displacement is uh, more than five millimeters, so uh, this will be treated, as we said before, by internal fixation. Um, if after reduction, uh, the displacement of the greater tuberosity is minimal, uh, it can be uh, treated non-operatively. Uh, thank you. I, I uh, hope that this lecture and other lecture uh, will be uh, for benefit for you in both your um, uh, clinical work and exams.